Cameron Dulek, and I'm a chartered professional accountant and a certified public accountant. Moving to the U.S. has a number of tax planning opportunities. I mean, firstly, there's lower tax rates in the U.S. generally. The top marginal rate is 37% in the U.S. Uh, federally, and even when you throw tax rates uh, in states that have taxes, uh, you can go up to 50%, which is right around where Canadian taxes are, but those tax rates start at over a million dollars U.S. We get to 50% in Canada, almost at around $200,000 Canadian. So there's huge differences in both tax rates and tax rate structure in the U.S. People that have things like registered retirement savings plan have a tax planning opportunity. People who have Canadian corporations have tax planning opportunities. There's a bunch of other situations too that people who plan in advance can avoid adverse tax results by planning before they get to the U.S. And those include things like ownership of private Canadian corporations, ownership of Canadian mutual funds, registered educational savings plans. Those all have tax planning opportunities available to them. One of the big issues about moving to the U.S. is when do you become a resident of the U.S.? Uh, I've heard of clients say, uh, well, no, no, I'm a resident of Canada. I said, but you've lived in the U.S. for five years. So, well, no, I, I don't really mean to. I think I'm a Canadian resident. Well, Canadian tax rules are based on common law issues and common law and are subjective. U.S. residency rules are objective. And they say things, if you've spent more than 182 days in the U.S., you are a U.S. resident under U.S. tax law. Well, it's easy to show that someone could be a resident of the U.S. under U.S. tax law, but continue to be a resident of Canada under Canadian tax law. In those situations, the Canada-U.S. tax treaty will determine where you actually reside. Someone needs to pay attention to that as to when residency starts and how you become a U.S. resident and when you cease to be a Canadian resident. Now, one of the big issues for you when you uh, cease to be a resident of Canada is what Canada is referred to in Canada at least as departure tax. And that tax is any unrealized appreciation in your worldwide assets. There's certain exceptions to that rule, but generally they'll apply to any assets you hold worldwide. In other words, they're not just Canadian assets, they may be shares of General Motors or shares of Apple. Those would all be subject to tax. U.S. real property would be subject to tax. So when you depart Canada, you're going to pay tax on any unrealized gain. The tax rate would be at whatever the capital gain rate is in your province. Typically, that's around 24, 25% in most provinces. So if you had a million dollars of unrealized appreciation, you would pay tax on that gain. Now, it's not as bad as it sounds, but first I want to tell you about the things that are not subject to that tax. And those are things like registered retirement savings plans. They're not subject to tax. Canadian real property is not subject to departure tax. Uh, registered accounts, we already talked about RSPs, tax-free savings accounts, registered retirement income funds, none of those things are subject to this tax. Stock options are not subject to departure tax. You know, departure tax sounds awful, uh, that you get taxed when you leave a country, you haven't sold anything, and the tax dollars may be significant. That's clearly the bad news. The good news is you don't have to pay it. As long as you provide security, and we'll talk about that in a second, to CRA, and your return for the year you depart is timely filed, you don't have to pay the tax. So. You ask, well, when do I have to pay the tax? Well, you actually have to pay the tax at some point in time. It's really one of two points in time. Either when you sell the asset and actually dispose of it, and that includes transfers to other corporations and things like that, that's a disposition. Or two is when you die. Now that doesn't sound good either. But when you think about it this way, is if you stayed in Canada and you sold the asset, you'd pay Canadian tax anyways. If you died owning the asset, you'd again pay Canadian tax on death because Canada taxes assets when you die as if you'd sold them. So there's really not a difference here in terms of taxation. It's an acceleration of tax, but as long as you don't sell that asset, 
you don't pay the tax on it until you actually sell it. But you do have to give Canada Revenue Agency security so they know they're gonna collect their tax. So what sort of security is that? Well, typically it falls into, uh, I'm gonna say three different categories. One is uh, you actually uh, give them like a letter of credit from a bank. It has to be from a Canadian bank that says, uh, you promised to pay $100,000. And there's a cost that you have to renew that on an annual basis. Or two is you can actually give them the asset which results in the, uh, in the departure tax. So if it's shares of a Canadian corporation, you'd say, hold these shares and uh, CRA will hold the shares. And uh, thirdly is you can provide some other forms of securities which could include uh, you know, pledging your investment account or something like that with CRA. The, the best news of all is you don't have to pay the tax and you don't have to pay interest either. So it, it's really that when you hear people leave in Canada, people say, oh, it's too expensive to leave Canada. That's really only occurs in one scenario is they don't have suitable assets to pledge to CRA against the tax. And yes, that does happen. Um, in most cases, there are solutions for that. Now, when Canadians leave Canada and they cease to be residents of Canada, after they've ceased their Canadian residency, they're only subject to Canadian tax on what I would refer to as Canadian source income. That's typically income paid by Canadians, with some important exceptions here. So when you receive uh, dividends from a Canadian corporation, those would be subject to Canadian tax. But instead of paying graduated rates of tax on, you'll pay a flat rate on the gross amount paid out to you. So the dividend would be subject to, when you go to a place like the US, be subject to a flat rate of 15%, and that's the treaty rate for dividends. Interest paid by a Canadian bank or Canadian person would not be subject to withholding. There's no withholding rate on that. Uh, royalties, depends on what type of royalties they are. If they're copyright royalties, there's no Canadian tax. But if they're royalties that are in the form of rents for equipment, uh, that's 10%. So there's a range of different rates, but it's only Canadian source income. Now, one type of income surprises people because it's not the answer they think it would be. And that is when they, they, they provide their employment services and they're paid by a Canadian corporation. That's only Canadian source income when they provide those services in Canada. So where they provide services in the US but they're paid by a Canadian corporation or paid in Canadian dollars, that is not subject to Canadian tax. It's only when they actually provide those services in Canada. And there's some thresholds that say if it's less than $10,000 in total, there's no Canadian tax on that. There's another exception that has no limit, and that says if they're in Canada for less than 183 days, and their compensation is not borne by a Canadian corporation, or, or what's called a permanent establishment, then they also wouldn't pay Canadian income tax. So executives traveling from the US to Canada generally are not gonna pay Canadian tax. And that same rule applies for Canadian executives who work in the US. Now payments from your registered retirement savings plan, your RRSP, are subject to a 15% withholding tax, like dividends, but that only applies if they're periodic payments. If you take a lump sum withdrawal, it's a 25% tax rate on that. Rents are actually an entirely different category, and when you see rents from a Canadian re real property, you'll be subject to a 25% tax on the gross rents unless you make alternative arrangements with CRA to be taxed on the net income. And in that case, you'd be taxed on the net rental income and you'd pay graduated rates of tax on that, which is usually the preferable solution. Canada Pension Plan payments, interesting, are not subject to Canadian tax when they're paid to you in the US. So there's no Canadian tax on Canada Pension Plan payments. The sale of Canadian real estate will not generally be subject to Canadian tax if you're not a resident of Canada, where you sell your principal residence in the year after you depart Canada. So if you left Canada in 2021 and sold the property in 2022, you wouldn't pay any Canadian tax if it was your principal residence. 
When Canadians move to the U.S. and become residents in the United States, they're subject to U.S. tax on a worldwide income. U.S. tax rates for income taxes, the top marginal rate in the U.S. is 37% federally. And that affects people whose taxable income is over 600,000 in the U.S. State income tax rates range from 0%, because there are a number of states that don't have a state personal income tax, those are states like Texas and Florida, Washington, Nevada, Wyoming, Alaska, and there's a few other states that only tax certain types of income as well. Those rates range from 0% to as high as 13%. Probably the average state tax rate is closer to about 5 or 6%. So you might end up paying a top marginal rate in the U.S. of something like 40 to 45%. And yet that's on a much higher taxable income when you hit the top marginal tax rates. Interestingly enough, capital gains are taxed at a preferential rate like Canada, except instead of being about 25%, it's about, it's 20% in the US. And that same rate also applies to what are called qualified dividends, that they'll also be subject to a lower rate. So most people pay on investment income in the US, pay about 20%. One additional tax applies to people in the U.S., and that's something called the net investment income tax. A lot of people know it by its other name, Obamacare. And this tax is at 3.8%, and it's on investment income received, uh, where you exceed certain thresholds of what's called modified adjustable income. Generally, U.S. residents are also subject to U.S. Social Security and Medicare taxes. They're roughly the equivalent of Canadian pension plan, a Canadian pension plan, uh, but they're very different in the amounts they take. U.S. Social Security benefits are about triple the amount that you'd get in Canada pension plan, but the cost is about five times higher. Now, think about it this way. A lot of people say, aren't these things wonderful? These are really enforced savings plans. You're required by law in both Canada and the U.S. to make payments to these programs. You, you don't have a choice. Most of those returns are not very good returns. The only thing that's really good about them is they're guaranteed. They might not be worth anything when you receive them due to inflation and other factors like that, but they are required by law. The, the interesting thing is how expensive U.S. Social Security is. The top premium for uh, Canada Pension Plan today is less than $3,000 Canadian. There is no limit on the amount of U.S. Social Security and Medicare tax you might pay. There's a cap actually on, on Social Security, but there's no cap at all on Medicare. Someone who's making over $100,000 a year, if they were employed in Canada, they'd be paying less than $3,000 Canadian. But if they're employed in the U.S., their costs would be about over $7,500 U.S. That's a huge difference in cost. There's very unique circumstances where people can qualify to escape U.S. Social Security. If you move to the U.S. and you're transferred by your employer, that's one of those opportunities. Deductions that uh, people resident in the U.S. get, they get a standard deduction. The U.S. has changed its structure. Formerly, they received personal exemptions and a standard deduction. Now, their standard deduction for an individual is worth $12,000. If they're married and they file jointly, it jumps to $24,000 US. US persons or US residents still get to itemize their deductions, but they have to have expenses in excess of the standard deduction to actually get any benefit from that. Yes, mortgage interest and property taxes are still deductible, but unless they exceed the standard deduction, $12,000 or $24,000, they don't really creating value for you. Now, you can also deduct state taxes, and that includes uh, state income taxes, state property taxes, state sales taxes. But one of the changes in U.S. tax law in 2017 is those deductions are limited to a maximum of $10,000. So if you're in a high tax state like California, New York, most of the northeastern states, Hawaii, those states become more expensive for you tax-wise because you no longer can deduct all those taxes in determining your 
US federal income tax. So they've actually experienced declines in population because of that, where people want to move to low tax states like the states without an income tax like Washington, Texas, or Florida. Uh, those all don't have an income tax.